My name is Philippe Labon. I'm the owner of the gallery of the same name, uh, located in Chelsea. Our gallery opened its door about three months ago and specialized solely in original comic art and illustrations. Um, we are very grateful to showcase uh, currently the work of Dave McKean, um, celebrated for his Batman, Arkham Asylum, Cages, and illustration of Sandman covers and so many other great pieces. Dave is not only an illustrator um, and comic book artist, but also graphic designer and musician. Um, a touche a tout, um, like we would say in France, I guess that everybody already figured out that I'm not from Pittsburgh. Um, in our exhibit, we have the privilege of showcasing uh, his graphic novel, Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash, which was commissioned um, by the 1418 Now Foundation and the Imperial War Museum. Uh, it is an interesting exhibit as we were able to gather 21 pieces that demonstrate Dave's mastery of drawing, painting, uh, collage, uh, photography, and digital art. Um, it is quite a complete exhibit and many visitors uh, mentioned that it looks like we have 21 different artists um, as each piece is so different from the next. Um, to moderate our panel, I'm grateful to have uh, Bill Cartalopoulos in charge. Uh, Bill needs new introduction, but I will still mention that, that uh, Bill teaches classes, uh, classes uh, about comics and graphic novels uh, at Parson and uh, in the MFA uh, program, um, visual narrative program at the School of Visual Arts. He has worked as an assistant uh, to uh, Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Art Spiegelman. Uh, he co-founded the Brooklyn Comics and Graphic Festival and has directed programming for the SPX and MoCA festivals. He has created uh, many comics exhibit in the US and also in France, Greece, Switzerland. And he was also the series editor for the New York Times bestselling um, Best American Comic Series. Um, he's currently working, if I'm not mistaken, on a book about comics, uh, for Princeton University Press. I had the chance one year to go to Angoulême uh, with, uh, with Bill to the Angoulême Festival and it's just a plain nightmare. I do cannot walk 10 yards without somebody stopping, stopping Bill, actually. Nobody cares about me. Um, in any case, um, thank you to all the participants to the panel and a big thank you to the Society of Illustrators, Anna Miller, uh, Lindsay Comden for make it the, making this happen. Um, our exhibit will last until August 15. Uh, we are located on the ground floor on 24th Street. Um, we love to welcome you in our gallery. With no further ado, I'm going to let Bill take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe, and thank you, Lindsay, and thanks to uh, the Society of Illustrators as well. Um, so I'm going to um, pretty much jump right into this, uh, and thank you, I should say, before we anything else, thank you to Dave for being here today. I'm really looking forward to talking to you, Dave, uh, other than uh, a, a quick hello uh, the other day. Um, we've never spoken before, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, uh, but we're doing this talk really to mark two um, events. One is the current exhibition of, of uh, Dave's art for Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash that uh, Philippe was just talking about, as well as Dave's forthcoming book, Raptor, uh, which we'll see uh, a few images from as well. Um, and basically both of those works are graphic novels that Dave has written and drawn. Um, and that kind of gave me a little cue for today because I, you know, it made me think that for all of the different things we could talk about in Dave's career, his illustration, his design work, his work as a film director, has other multimedia collaborations, his collaborations with writers and so forth. Um, I thought maybe today what we could really do is mainly focus on Dave's work as a writer artist, or in other words, a cartoonist, someone who writes and draws their own comics, uh, as opposed to maybe, um, you know, focusing on collaborations and, and multimedia and stuff, but really talking about uh, the comics that, that probably most directly represent um, Dave's point of view. Um, at the same time, Dave's been involved with many well-known collaborations, and, and I will touch on those as well. Um, and I'd like to do that actually by, by way of talking about my own personal history uh, with Dave's work a little bit up front. Um, so bear with me. Some of this will seem like um, obscure personal trivia, but I think it'll be a, a good way to actually get into um, 
uh, some of the aspects of, of Dave's, Dave's career that have uh, struck other people the way that they struck me. So uh, let me, oops, let me uh, share my screen first because uh, I've got some images I'd like to talk through for, for the remainder of our time here. Okay, is everyone seeing this introductory slide? Does this look good? It's filling up the screen and everything. Okay. Uh, oops. Let me get the chat up too, just so that that way, if there's a question or an issue, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll have a clue. Okay, fantastic, great. Let's get going here. Okay, so what I wanted to start out by noting is that you know this isn't always the case for every uh, you know artist that someone might be familiar with. But I remember exactly uh, when and where I first saw Dave McKean's work. Um, and in fact, I first saw Dave McKean's work at the Franklin Park Mall in Toledo, Ohio. Um, and this is, I was very happy to find this picture of the mall's grand opening in 1971, because it didn't look that different uh, when I was a kid in the 80s visiting my grandparents in Ohio. I was myself living in New Jersey. My grandparents lived in Ohio. I visited them every summer. Uh, and every day we went to the mall. And uh, at the mall every day, I went to this store, B. Dalton's Bookseller, which is one of the many chain bookstores in the United States that have since been, uh, you know, absorbed by uh, Barnes and Noble and then uh, Amazon. Um, but nevertheless, I used to go every every day to this B. Dalton Bookseller uh, for one very good reason, um, among others. But the most salient reason was that they had spinner racks. Okay, they had comic books. So I used to go basically stand around at the B. Dalton's bookstore and you know i would buy some comic books and then i would just kind of stand around and read other ones because you know when, when you're like an adolescent you can only afford so many comic books uh, but these were not these comic books on the spinner racks at the b dalton's bookstore were not the only comics in the store in the back of the store there was a humor section and most of the stuff in the uh humor section was stuff like this you know garfield gains weight his second book um you know there's i i had another one you know i mean i, I had I had books like this, you know, so there was a lot of humor stuff, but because uh, at the time graphic novels, you know, we're talking about the mid 80s, graphic novels were starting to appear in American bookstores, Art Spiegelman's Mouse uh, had been published and, and, and there, were, there were graphic novels accumulating, but there weren't very many of them, so there was no place to put them. So as a result, they often would get shelved in the humor section, regardless of whether or not they were very humorous. Uh, so for example, in the humor section of this particular B. Dalton's bookstore in, in Toledo, Ohio, uh, I found a copy of God Loves, Man Kills, the, the X-Men graphic novel by uh, you know Chris Claremont and Brent Anderson. And it was like, you know, kind of fascinating. It was like, wow, here's this kind of adult, uh, you know, sort of political uh, X-Men comic book that was different from the X-Men comics that I was seeing on the spinner racks. Uh, and they had one other book there featuring a superhero character who I was also fond of, and that was Arkham Asylum that was written by Grant Morrison and drawn by Dave McKean. And you, know, and you can see how clearly this is something that belongs on the same shelf as Garfield gains weight. You know, obviously these are you know very similar books targeting the same uh, audience. Um, but anyway, this, this Arkham Asylum book, I'd never heard of this. You know, I thought of myself as someone who liked comic books, but most of my, uh, the comics I had access to were through newsstands and through other media. So I'd grown up, of course, watching the, you know, Batman TV series with Adam West and Burt Ward and, 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 and all the rest. Um, and that was also 1989, the year that Arkham Asylum came out, was also the same year as the, um, uh, as, as the Batman movie directed by Tim Burton with Jack Nicholson and Michael Keaton, you know, and this was, you know, uh, build as a very kind of adult, dark, gothic take on Batman compared to uh, versions that had appeared before. And I thought I was, you know, I was about 14. I thought I was, yeah, ready for that more sophisticated take on Batman. But then I read uh, Arkham Asylum. And the way that I read Arkham Asylum was almost like, um, like, as if it was a kind of like dark pornography that I felt sort of like weird about looking at because I was standing in the in the bookstore I would go and I would just like read this a few pages at a time and then I would like periodically be arrested by some image that was just like 
too creepy. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. And I would just kind of stop and then, you know, think like, I'm not sure if I want to look at this book. And then like a couple of days later, I'd find myself back at the bookstore kind of haunting the aisle, kind of, you know, furtively uh, trying to figure out where I was last time I was there, you know. So I'm sure, um, you know, some people who are here are familiar with this book, but it was, you know, this was a period where there were a certain number of painted comics out there. Um, uh, and, and, you know, like um, people like, you know, Bill Sienkiewicz and John J. Muth and, and uh, Kent Williams and others were making, you know, fully painted graphic novels. It was also an era of where there was a lot of experimentation having to do with the idea of the graphic novel as a format and comics for adults, including comics for adults featuring more, uh, you know, traditionally kid oriented superhero characters. And certainly Dave's uh, reinterpretation, you know, of, of visual reinterpretations of these characters uh, was quite terrifying. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, extremely well well painted and matched the 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 strong horror um, uh, motif of, of of the of the text by Grant Morrison, um, but there there were a couple of images from this book in particular that extremely creeped me out as an adolescent and really haunted me for a long time. And I never bought this book because I, I wasn't sure I wanted it in the house uh, as much as I like comics and, and even Batman. In particular, Dave, the two images that really like made me close the book, even though like I said, not necessarily for the last time. Where it was early on, there was a book where someone had bugs coming out of their mouth or like cockroaches coming out of this person's mouth and and like this merged in my brain with like a story I read later where someone was talking about um having having insects um uh, in their home and they talked about pouring the cereal in the morning and cockroaches coming out with the cereal so to this day I still keep my cereal in a plastic container um and and then the other one was a even this is not as graphic but it, an image of like a severed head inside of a, inside of a dollhouse and that was like a very traumatic moment in the text and was intended to be such um but anyway so that that was the first time I encountered Dave McKean's work just kind of haunting the the humor section of the Beatles Dalton's in, in Toledo, Ohio in, in the mid 80s. Um, but at that point, Dave, I did, did want to take a moment to um, ask you a little bit about this phase of the, the, this part of your career. Um, and that wasn't the first um, uh, fully painted uh, book or, or, or graphic novel that you had done. You had produced other work too, including collaborations uh, like Violent Cases and Black Orchid. Um, and I wanted to ask you just a little bit about this period of being an artist doing this kind of work and working within the comics industry in the 80s? Did it seem, and one of the things I'm kind of wondering about is like, what kind of career you thought you would have, you know? Like, did you think that you were going to be just kind of making one book after another, working with writers, making these very labor intensive graphic novels, or did you understand that comics were gonna be part of a range of work that you were going to be doing, including illustration and you know maybe other media? I'm just kind of wondering, because it was such a, all of this stuff, it seemed like a very vibrant moment in, in comics where it seemed like suddenly people were making books the likes of which we hadn't seen before. And I'm wondering how you thought you fit into that. Well, you're really dredging through my ancient past here now. This is 30 odd years ago. Um, <laughs> and it all, to be honest, it all looks like art school stuff to me now. Um, I, I, this is basically the, the sort of thing I was, I was playing around with in art school, uh, painting and drawing, making collage, uh, going to the photography department and raiding the dark room and taking cameras out, making films and just playing. And all of those, uh, all of that fun that I had really, uh, experimentation, went into the first jobs that I did. Um, and I always loved comics. I made comics in art school. I had three other friends in art school who were also comic fans. So we made a, a little uh, a, a comic called Meanwhile, which was terrible. I tried to find every existing copy and burn them, but I think some have escaped me. Um, and those, those were the comics that were seen by editors in London that got me a, a gig on a magazine where I met Neil uh, Gaiman. Um, and so uh, in art school, uh, I, I just wanted, well, I went to art school just wanting to draw comics and do maybe record covers because I love music as well. I was playing in bands. Um, and I just wanted to be left alone to do that. And then after a year of arguing with all my teachers, they finally got me to look up and out into the world 
and then I just became a sponge for a whole world of, of different influences and work. And, and so I left art school still loving comics, but maybe in a, in a different way. Uh, I just I wanted to, to try and push them into uh, new places. I'd seen lots of comics from around the world, uh, lots of European comics and uh, various people experimenting in different ways. And I wanted to, to do that. Uh, I still wanted to do album covers. I still wanted to do book covers. So that was my goal really. And if at some point I got a chance to do anything else, make a film or work in theatre, then I'd do it. I, I'm very, very happy to try anything. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, that's so that that um, yeah, I think I think that's as I teach students too, and I always um, really encourage them to just like try new things in in school because as art students, you really have the opportunity to soak up a lot of influences and also to try and fail. And it's the only context where you're not potentially going to suffer like an economic uh, um, uh, problem if if you. Try try something and it just doesn't work out you know it's just uh so so that's um that's a good illustration of precisely that um and i, I promise this next um uh, personal anecdote is going to be a little bit briefer probably a lot briefer but the next the next part of your work that i was aware of um because in addition to doing uh comics like these you at the same time, almost, I think we're doing covers for Hellblazer and, and, and other comics. And the, then I did sort of become peripherally aware um, of, of Sandman. It was something that I, once I had the opportunity to start going to comic book stores, I would sort of see it around and it just looked sort of like um, so different from everything else in the shop. And, but I also didn't know how to access it, you know, like with like with Batman Arkham Asylum, there was a character I, I recognized, so I, you know, would access that. I wasn't sure what Sandman was. It was already quite a bit into the series at that point, you know, so it seemed a little daunting to get into. Um, but then I went to a very tiny comics festival at a, at a crappy Holiday Inn in Clinton, New Jersey that un has since been refurbished. Unfortunately, I have not found an image of it uh, when it was pre-refurbishment, but there someone at a folding table uh, was selling this comic book, uh, which was the Sa a Sandman one shot about that I could see right away it had something to do with the myth of Orpheus at an interesting looking cover and it was a one shot. And, you know, I don't know if you can tell from my last name, Cartolopoulos, but my family is Greek. My dad is, a, is from Greece and I grew up with uh, Greek myths as bedtime stories. So this just like immediately, I, I immediately just grabbed this. Um, and, and, and for, it was, it was, um, uh, it really worked for me for a number of reasons, you know, because it was a retelling of the myth of Orpheus, of course, with the interior art by Brian Talbot. You know, it was very interesting to see the mythos of Sandman interwoven with that um, story that I already knew. But then, of course, the cover was very attractive and had this very unique uh, feature where you had used um, glow in the dark ink so that there is a, a secret uh, second image and message that um, uh, shows up when someone sees uh, when, when someone sees the cover in the dark, assuming it's been sitting out in the light. So from that point forward, I was reading Sandman. And I think like everyone else, I found the um, just the covers so compelling, especially because the artists in the interior of the comic book were always changing. But the covers were unlike anything else out there and, 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 and unpredictable, but at the same time gave the book a um, unified identity. And one of the things that I was really impressed by was the um, materiality of the covers, that it wasn't just that they were painted or just that they incorporated ph photography or collage, but sometimes some of them almost looked like they were photographs of three-dimensional assemblages. And I don't know if, if, if it was exactly that or if there was some image manipulation that made it look like that. But I'm wondering how you um, developed this way of composing images that have this sense of materiality and assemblage to them. Um, okay, well, we're still 30 years ago. So uh, I <laughs> just want to, uh, you know, <laughs> move things along at some point. Um, so, but the idea with Sandman was, um, I was convinced that, that there was a readership out there who um, would give comics a go if uh, they felt that they were being spoken to in their language. And by that, I mean, in the swim of current book covers and album covers and mm -hmm. film posters and things like that. Um, 
and uh, so that's what we were trying to do really. I wanted to reach out to what I felt was a broader audience, a visually literate audience mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that would uh, that would give it a try because I thought Neil was going to try and do that in the stories, in the scripts. Right, right. Tell more of a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a genre story, but they're not uh, traditional sort of comic book -y stories. Um, right, right. So that seemed appropriate. And then um, it was just a, a question of trying to find the right tone of voice for each of the, each of the different story arcs that Neil was doing. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was finding new media, finding new things to play with. Um, so some of it was uh, just what I was really into at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I found colour copy machines at one point and had a great few days torturing this colour photocopier into spitting out images that I thought I could use for the mm -hmm. Game of You covers. Um, around about halfway through the run, um, I started doing a lot of album covers and got very involved in that. And I, to be honest, I was getting a bit bored with the Sandman uh, monthly uh, ticking away. But then I got a Mac um, and I read the Photoshop manual from first page to last page and thought somebody just written it for me because it's all the stuff I really wanted to do. And Photoshop was uh, absolutely designed for me personally. I'm sure that was the case. Um, so then I started using um, uh, Photoshop in about 1993, I think, quite early on. Mm -hmm. And um, that helped me find some of those sort of translucent images, layered images that I was trying to get using uh, double exposures, triple exposures and photographic effects and uh, transparent papers and things like that. But Photoshop is such a powerful tool that allowed me to uh, play even more. Mm -hmm. um, well, I hope you'll allow me to just ask about um... Uh, one older piece of work before we turn to Black Dog, because I, I think it could be a nice um, transitional thing. Uh, and that's uh, the other body of work that you were producing at the same time you were produce doing this monthly assignment, and that was Cages. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, the, the two works that we're principally looking at today are works where, you know, you are the writer and the artist. You're not, you know, it's not an illustration assignment. You're not, you know, um, and have, you know, putting in a visual onto someone else's story um, in cages. This was really um, uh, other than death talks about life. Uh, this was the first time I, I was really um, aware, although I guess, no, you were, you were um, drawing Neil's uh, text there, Neil Gaiman's text there too. I guess this was the first time that I was aware of you as someone who was a, a writer artist, you know, like, like any uh, cartoonist we might talk about. And this was a series you serialized really almost, it seems like this was happening almost exactly the same time that you were working on Sandman, give or take a year uh, uh, on either end. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the covers um, uh, show, you know, much the same kind of approach that you were just discussing uh, as what you were doing for the Sandman covers. This is the collected edition that came out in 1998. Um, but what we see, what we see inside is this very, um, uh, fluid, naturalistic, realistic kind of uh, drawing style, um, but at the same time also, you know, as impressive as this is in and of itself, um, it turns out that it's part of a strategy in this book of that involves a lot of different visual styles. And this is, this connects, it's a black dog, like Philippe was just saying, you know, where the exhibit looks like the work of 21 different artists or, or um, a so-called, uh, a raptor rather, um, which, which also uh, uses multiple visual styles. And here it's just, you know, we see, uh, you know, this more um, uh, black and white kind of uh, painterly approach. We see things that look like manipulated photography. Um, and then there are these thrilling moments where you juxtapose different visual styles together. Uh, so you have a storyteller and then the story that they're telling and those are represented in different visual styles as well. And there are quite a few more um, examples we can look at here. Um, but reading Cages is interesting because it really seems very much like I don't know, like maybe what, and I don't know if it felt like this to you at the time, and I know this was a while ago, but it almost feels like an artist's thesis statement or an artist's attempt to make a work through which they can arrive at a thesis statement, which is, it seems to have something to do with, you know, exploring what is the purpose of creativity or what are the, um, the possible uses of creativity. And at the same time, you're also exploring all the different ways that you yourself can be creative. 
um, the, that you can express yourself stylistically. Um, I'm, I mean, does this sound at all like what you had in mind when you were working on this book? Yeah, that's pretty much exactly uh, a good chunk of uh, the motivation for doing the book. Um, before I started doing the work at DC, I was always um, writing my own stories. Mm -hmm. Stories that I did in art school and, um, you know, the first little sto short stories I did, I was writing my own stories anyway. So it was actually a bit of a diversion to start going, working with other writers. Um, I started um, very much as uh, in control of my own stories. Mm -hmm. So it was love. So having done a couple of things with Neil and having done that, the book with Grant, um, I was sort of really chopping at the bit to write something myself, go back to, you know, where I started mm -hmm. and, um, and see what I could do there. And I wanted to continue this idea of um, uh, going back to how real people talk and how they move and the gestures that they make and not the regular sort of comic book styles that are so embedded, particularly in American comics, I think, slightly less lesser in European comics, but there is that style that, that is the, the many, many vast children of Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and the rest mm -hmm. of those guys. Um, I wanted to try and go back to um, how real people move. And I did that a bit with the books for DC, but I think they got bogged down really with being overly painted and overly illustrated. And I felt the storytelling was getting very slow and rather lugubrious. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted something much lighter that felt much more sketchy and quick and more almost like a, like a hand drawn, like a, you know, like handwriting or something. Mm -hmm. Something very, very um, easy to uh, let the storytelling tick by very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you really get a feel for how these people move and gesture and, and speak. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the dialogue to be the way that I know that people speak. They start sentences and then bail out halfway through and go um and er a lot and you know all of those things i wanted to find that humanness in the storytelling so that was one i I'm, i've always been interested in what we believe i'm not i'm not a person of faith but i'm but we all find a faith of some kind something to believe in something that makes life valuable and have purpose and i'm always interested in those ideas and wanted to get that some of that in there i love jazz and i wanted to have some reference to jazz and visualizing jazz and the rhythms of jazz and the relationship between jazz and the way that we interact as humans. Um, and then there's just the, the, the pleasure of drawing. I, I just love drawing mm -hmm. and the, very, the, the different ways you can make images. I love making photographs. I love making collages. And it always seemed crazy to me that a story can go through many different emotions and atmospheres and feeling. Mm -hmm. And yet, for some reason, the illustrator draws them all in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Whereas color, tone, whether an image is photographic or drawn or mm -hmm. painted or realistic or mm -hmm. abstract, all of these things add to understanding those emotions and feelings in the story. And I, I always wanted to, to if I, you know, I'm, I, I, I love doing them all, so I'm very happy to find places for them all in, in the story, so long as it's appropriate, so long as those are the best ways that I think the story can be told and felt. Yeah, what, what you said, I, I love that you just used the word atmosphere. You were talking about the atmosphere or temperature of different parts of a story, because that was exactly what I, that, that when, uh, you know, I, I reread Cage's um, in preparation for this, and that was exactly the word that came into my mind, you know, when you first introduced early on this um, changes in different uh, visual styles, you know, because it's not as if like different sections are drawn in different styles. I mean, the interleaving of, of visual styles here, it's just the, it's just kind of like there's a situation that's happening outside and then we follow the cat, you know, and then the cat looks in through the windows and it's almost like there's just a different 
atmosphere inside this other place you know it's not that it's another reality or a story within a story or anything like that although you do those things as well but it just creates a sense of like you know being here feels different you know than than being here you know uh or or uh you know being you know here you know inside this narrative um so yeah that sense of, of different different moods and different styles um one of the things that you mentioned before too is um uh, European comics, you mentioned a couple of times now the influence of European comics. And I had noticed um, that you mentioned in cages up front some of the other artists whose work you were looking at. I just grabbed a couple of, of images like you um, you mentioned Lorenzo Matotti, who was, whose book, uh, I think his, his he had a couple of books in particular that have been translated into English, uh, Fires, and then another one, the, the title of which is escapes me right now. I want to say Vesper, but I'm not 100% sure if that's correct. Um, and uh, Jose Munoz, and these are both artists who I was familiar with from Raw Magazine. Um, and it seems it kind of, you know, what you were talking to about before about just wanting to represent everyday life in a way, both the European influence and that wanting to represent everyday life, they both remind me of the things that I've seen in like Escape Magazine, where it kind of seems like in a way cages, even though you had done this very, you know, uh, mainstream uh, work in some respects, in, in many ways cages seems like the uh, had some of the same concerns as the as the um independent comics in escape magazine you know which also had that strong european influence i think because england is maybe you know between the us and, and europe so you're in a kind of privileged position there um did you feel like you had some kind of aesthetic goals in common with you know like eddie campbell and, and glenn dakin and, and and those kinds of people when you were making work like that um probably not um, those artists in particular, but certainly Escape as an idea. Uh, uh, Paul Gravett uh, ran the magazine and ran the stand at Westminster Comic Mart that I used to go to with my copies of Meanwhile, and that's where I met Paul. And he's such a wonderful enthusiast uh, for comics. And um, uh, so I, his enthusiasm rubs off on you. And um, and the Escape magazine stall was full of small press, um, people trying different things, and most of them were of a much more personal kind of storytelling than uh, the mainstream comics. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that's where my heart was anyway. I mean, those were the kinds of stories I liked uh, drawing in art school. Those were the kinds of films that I gravitate to. Um, so, as a, again, this sort of diversion to DC for a couple of years doing main comics really was, it was good fun and it was an illustration job and I was grateful for the work, but it really wasn't, you know, ever my, where my uh, interest was uh, mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. Um, so a story like Cage is much more like that. You mentioned Mignot and Matotti, clearly they're, they're two huge influences for me. I think Matotti is probably the greatest comics artist there's ever been. Um, I think he's, Absolutely extraordinary. And Munoz is glorious as well. And there is and there are several other, you know, wonderful um European artists. And if anything, there was a magazine called Medias Revueltos that I found in Spain that had a, just a massive effect on me. That was the one that really crystallized the ladder that I wanted to be on and uh, the kind of work I wanted to do. And even more than raw. And I love raw. I thought raw was extraordinary. But Medias Revueltos had an amazing effect on me. Um, oh, that's so interesting. And um, yeah, I think I could be wrong, but I think Max might have been the editor of that ma Spanish magazine you were just talking about, or at least he was involved with. He's a Spanish cartoonist who just goes by, by the name Max, but I, I could be mistaken. I'd be curious to look that up. Um, uh, but no, I, I think that's also interesting in a way what you said just now too kind of reminded me of things that David Mazzucchelli has said as well, you know, that like, you know, he was drawing these superhero comics and thinking like, these aren't the kinds of stories I actually watch in, when I go to the movies or when I read books, you know, and, and so of course he also in, in, in a way moved, uh, you know, he also like you, um, you know, has, um, uh, you know, kind of did the, the did the mainstream comics thing for a while, and then found a center of activity someplace else. Um, and I think uh, I think we sh we could turn now to um, uh, Black Dog, you know, which is also uh, a graphic novel that you've written and drawn. Um, at the same time, it seems like it was very much prompted by 
um, the um, centennial anniversary of World War One. My understanding of this project, uh, and, and Philippe referred to this earlier, is that um, uh, uh, this project uh, was commissioned by a number of organizations, including 1418 Now and a comics festival in Amiens, France, and um, the Lakes uh, Comics, Lakes International Comics Festival, and, and maybe some other organizations. And it was a project to commemorate the centennial of World War I. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is how the general idea of some kind of project to commemorate World War I became very specifically a graphic novel about this this real artist named Paul Nash. When one opens the book, Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash, you immediately give the reader some photographic evidence indicating this was a real person. They actually existed, you know, in case the reader isn't aware of who Paul Nash was. This is a photograph of Paul Nash uh, that I'm show very quickly just so that you know more more photographic evidence um but i'm wondering how the idea of doing some kind of project based on the centennial of world war one became uh, a project about the artist paul nash um well it was uh, a completely out of the blue uh call to pitch an idea for this foundation uh the 1480 now foundation had been commissioning about 25 artworks each year for four years in 2014 through 2018 um, to commemorate the First World War in every medium. So extraordinary sculptures and film works, uh, poetry, photographic works, everything. And they wanted to do a comic book of some kind. Um, so they asked me to pitch an idea. And it was that open, really. It just needed to be uh, about some aspect of the First World War. Um, and before I got off the phone uh, with them, I immediately thought it would be really, I've always been interested in the First World War. I've never done anything about it, but it's one of those opportunities to dive into a world and, and, and soak in it for a, a, a while and, and research and, um, and then try and express the things that you find there. Um, and I, before I got off the phone, I immediately thought it had to be about the experiences of one person, trying to see those, trying to imagine going through those experiences through the eyes of one person. And it took a while to think that it, it would be interesting if it was a creative person, because a lot of the soldiers that came back, a lot of the people that came back from the, the trenches did, really didn't talk about it. And they didn't want to talk about it. And uh, it was so painful. Um, they locked those memories away and, and, and didn't uh, talk about their experiences. And some of the creative people were like that as well, but it's in the work that they do. So Paul Nash was um, a young man uh, going into this. Um, he was a rather wishy-washy symbolist um, in love with William Blake and uh, writing bits of poetry on the side of his drawings going into this. Um, and uh, in the trenches, he found a voice. He found um, his voice visually, this tough painting style that he came back with um, and made archetypal images expressing the horror of the First World War and what we do to each other, but by painting landscapes. This is the most famous uh, painting that he made. We are making a new world with not a single person in it. And yet it's full of human, humanity. The, the dead trees look like arms reaching up, the blood of the sky, the sort of purulent flesh of the mud. Um, I think it's an extraordinary painting. And I think this speaks about the nature of war in uh, war zones now in the 21st century, as powerful as it did a hundred years ago in the First World War. So, my choice was Paul Nash uh, to, uh, to, um, to try and do a book from his perspective. And the more I knew a bit about him, because um, he was from a circle of artists that included Stanley Spencer, and I grew up near Cookham, and that's where Stanley Spencer lived. So I was very familiar with him and that circle. Um, I went to the Slade, and, um, and so as soon as I started 
reading about him and reading his autobiography that he didn't finish, but a lot he wrote a lot uh, of work there, and then reading his letters, which have been published, um, and really diving into his work and researching more about the First World War. Um, it just became more and more personal. He lost his mother when he was young. I lost my father, and it, that was a shadow over his life, and uh, uh, certainly a shadow over mine as well. Um, he was born, well, about five miles away in the end from where I was born uh, and grew up around there. And I knew that landscape very well. And then after the war, here is an image from Dimchurch. Uh, and th that's where I live now, just down the road from Dimchurch. And he lived in Rye, that, black, that blue plaque that you showed at the beginning is on a house in Rye. That's where I live now. So... We, and I'm, so I know the landscape that he drew then as well. So it, it really did become uh, like I was walking in his footsteps or he was a little ghost on my shoulder or something. Um, and so um, I didn't want to do just a straight uh, biography because uh, he's a very key artist in England. He's unknown outside of England, really. But he's a key person between the 19th century romantic era and the, 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 the internationalists like Francis Bacon and Graham Sutherland that did travel around the world. He's a, the key man in between. Um, so I, I read a lot about him and um, uh, the, the, I didn't want to, as I was, sorry, I was in the middle of saying I didn't want to do a straight biography because there's a lot of biographical material about him already and it seemed kind of redundant to do that. And as soon as I started reading his autobiography, he's obsessed with dreams. I mean, he starts talking about a, a, an early childhood dream immediately, um, being trapped in this sort of tunnel space and see, finding this black dog that leads him out um, into the light. Um, and the black dog seemed to be like an avatar of some kind or some sort of spirit, some sort of, sometimes it's a shadow, sometimes it has a sort of, a rather disturbing character. Sometimes it's it's um, it seems to be some sort of uh, guide, um, and so uh, and then also the um, the term black dog uh, is a is a term meaning depression. Um, it was popularized by Churchill. Churchill didn't make it up, but he was the one that popularized it. Um, and Nash's mother suffered from depression and ended up in an asylum and died there. And everything Paul Nash did in his life had that shadow of depression over it. Not that he suffered from depression, but he felt that he was susceptible to that. And coming out of his experiences in the First World War, he felt that shadow around all the time. Um, and so the black dog seemed to be at the center of attention. That, that's where the title of the book came from. And then to make it as a sequence of dreams, and each dream would pick at certain aspects of his life growing up and just after the war, but also his experiences in the war and juxtapose those things in the way that dreams do, that sort of dream logic. Um, so that's, that's it. This is a page from um, a sequence where he's in the trenches, but remembering an old school friend called Eric Kennington who was a real, uh, real painter. He was a portrait painter, very, very uh, slick uh, and facile um, portrait painter. Um, and uh, he seemed to have a very easy life as a growing up as, in, in the school that, where they were and then in his, in, his, uh, in his life as a painter. Whereas everything Nash did, he found tough. He found drawing hard. Um, he found painting hard and you see that in the work. And I love that fight. That's what I love about his work. Whereas Kennington is certainly a very skilled painter, but it's all very slick and proficient and doesn't have that fight to it. So, uh, yeah. No, that's so interesting. Yeah, and I think that's, that's um, a good way of describing it. The book is almost told as a series of dreams where it's like each, it's, it's, or, you know, there, there are a few um, sequences that seem a little more, you know, maybe repertorial, for example, like the scene where he 
uh, encounters his brother in the bunker. Um, and, and, you know, this obviously has a more muted uh, uh, color palette here, but quite often it does feel like there are um, dreams or memories um, of 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 uh, different events, you know, that you know might get jumbled up, you know, or where there might be a kind of uh, confusion of one thing for another. Um, and uh, and again, throughout the book, you're using all of these different visual styles, which again, you know, give it the sense of each individual uh, dream being a, its own kind of event. So for example, a sequence like this, that again is a little more quotidian, has a kind of, you know, more straightforward kind of caricatural sort of drawing style, um, you know, and then, you know, the, you know, the sequence where he ships out to sea is this, you know, very impressionistic uh, painted sequence. Um, you know, there, there, there are these elements of, of collage that come into it as well. And this is a, a strong metaphorical image that we saw at the beginning earlier uh, behind Philippe um, and, and so forth. And, and, and so you're, in a way, I feel like you're, I'm, I'm you know, this, this seemed to kind of resonate with what, some of the things we were just saying about cages that, you know, you're mixing all these different visual styles for particular purposes. And also, you know, that, that question about like what the purpose of art is, is something that it seems like Paul Nash had to discover in a way, like what is it to have a purpose beyond just wanting to be one of the symbolists or one of the surrealists and, and well, just be in it. Well, this, this, this particular dream, this sequence is almost the key to it really. On these uh, pages, um, it's narrated, um, the, the text isn't there at the moment, but um, he's, he, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the life of a soldier was boring. It was, it was marching to position and then cleaning your weaponry and then making breakfast and waiting um, in miserable circumstances. But I think Nash and his brother both felt that it was their artist's eye that kept them sane. They found beauty in amongst these terrible circumstances, in amongst the desiccated, uh, destroyed landscape. They found small little shoots of greenery coming through. Um, in the air in the morning, the sky would fill with white butterflies. And they found these, these pieces of beauty, these little abstract moments of beauty. That's what the, the little, that's what the abstract shapes are to the side, really. The sense of finding, you know, uh, just, a, just a piece of colour, uh, beautiful in amongst all the mud. It's something that he would spot and nobody else would. And then at the end of the chapter, he talks about nature being there just out of out of picture it's waiting as soon as we finish this madness and we pack up our guns and and missiles and bullets and you know uniforms and and leave nature will like a tidal wave wash through the landscape again and fill the world with greenery and new growth um and he felt he extended that metaphor in a letter home by saying that's what we need to do we need to come back home we need to wash through english life like a wave of revolution and wipe the cant and lies out of english society he felt that people back home didn't understand what they were going through and what war was really like and um that's that was that became his purpose he felt he was a messenger not an artist he felt that he needed to get this message across. And this um, th this book has had um, a kind of a few different lives. I mean, it's a, it's a graphic novel that one can read. It's also been a, a performance piece at various venues. Um, these are some pictures from the, uh, I wanna say the Derby, um, Derby Book Week closing ceremony where you performed with two musicians. Can you talk a bit about the performance version of Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash? Yes, so the commission was um, to um, create the book, but also a performance work of some kind. So th to be honest, that could have just been me standing reading the book and showing some pictures, but I really wanted it to be um, something immersive. It's what we're trying to, what I try to do with the book. The book, the hardback particularly, is an oversized volume. So when you open the spread, the, the images are quite immersive. Um, and so as I was uh, writing it, because Nash used to write little pieces of poetry again at the side of his etchings and as a young man, um, 
I thought it might be interesting to start writing verse. So some of the things I was writing became lyrics. Um, and about halfway through the writing process, I had decided that it should be some sort of performance work with music and, and song. Um, and so quite a bit of the writing was done with, a, with an eye or an ear to it being eventually turned into lyrics and song. Um, I had done this once before. Um, I was asked to do a piece for the, at the Sydney Opera House. And um, I did a show called Nine Lives, which was uh, nine short stories uh, told in film and animation and music on stage with a quartet and a trumpet player and a percussionist and I played piano and song and uh, narration and full, full gamut of uh, multimedia. And I had such a great time, I was absolutely terrified to do it, but I had such a great time doing it that I was keen to try, try it again. Um, so while I was um, drawing the book, it took about four months to, to, uh, to draw and paint the book. At the same time, I wrote the music and I was listening to a lot of music from the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and so it is orchestral. It is influenced by music from that era, but also a lot of other music uh, and songwriting that I like from um, the uh, Threatening Opera and things like that, and uh, right the way up through to people like Stephen Sondheim. Great communicators in, in, in words and music, you know. Uh, and so I wrote an hour's worth of uh, orchestral music and um, and turn some of the pieces into songs. And then as soon as I finished the book, I recorded that music as backing tracks. Uh, and so the live performance is uh, Matthew Sharp, who's an amazing world-class cellist and baritone singer. Uh, my wife, Claire, is a violinist and she does, um, the, she speaks the lines of Nash's wife. And then I play piano and do the majority of the narration and uh, speak uh, Nash's words. And so uh, we, we, the, the music is our tick, click track, as it were. The music is constant all the way through. And we uh, come in and play little pieces. Uh, Matthew takes the solo cello parts. And then we perform the, the, uh, the uh, narration and, and acting throughout. And it's quite loud and quite, it, it's, it's, it has sound effects and um, uh, it's, it is an immersive piece, I, I, I hope. And we did, did it at the Tate uh, Gallery in London when Nash had a huge retrospective um, a couple of years ago. And then we've done it in Canada at festivals there and in India and various other places. Um, we've done, I don't know, 12, 15 performances, something like that. Is that something that you're still looking to tour? Like it could be an ongoing concern, like someone might dream of seeing this in the future? <laughs> um, it could be, although to be honest, it felt like it had its life uh, during the um, 1418 now um, life. So we did a couple in 2019, but um, I, think, I think it's probably had its life now. Um, if, if anybody ever wanted to, uh, put up a bit of money to fund performing it with a, an actual orchestra, I would be there as a, like a shot. I'd love to do it with a full orchestra, but as yet that's not happening. But uh, no, I, I think it's probably had its life and I'm sort of fishing around for maybe some other uh, multimedia project I could do. That makes sense. Um, well, uh, you know, as Philippe said at the at the top of the talk, the um, at least uh, one can see some of the originals uh, from Black Dog, if, if one happens to be in the New York area, and those uh, works are on view through August 14th. I just asked if Philippe had a few um, installation shots we could show, so I'm just putting a couple up here just so people can get a sense of it. And I also, Dave, in case you haven't seen it, uh, I just wanted to show you this one image that Philippe sent me of a dog hanging out in the middle of Black Dog. Um, uh, but that, so, but you're, you're uh, the last, the latest, I should say, uh, graphic novel project that you've done is, is Raptor, which is subtitled a so-called graphic novel, and that's coming out this summer, I think the um, 
North American publication date is in just a few weeks, maybe at the very beginning of August, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this is from Dark Horse Books. And this is also a graphic novel uh, you've written and drawn. Um, and like the other works that we we talked we've talked about, you know, it has uh, you know it shows um, you know your visual range. You know, there are a lot of different visual styles running through this, and it, and in this case. Um, you know, it's um, it's not dreams, but it's it's almost like story. It is kind of in this case like stories within stories. Somehow, there's a kind of meta fictional quality to the work, where there are these kind of different types of reality that come into contact with one another in these liminal uh, spaces. I'm just going to show um, a few images from this. Um, but so readers will have a chance to read this uh, very shortly. But I was wondering if you wanted to just say a few words about Raptor. Um, sure. Uh, you know, um, most of the stories that I end up writing, I really love um, stories about individual people going through very difficult or stressful circumstances. Uh, and the kinds of circumstances that in many ways we all go through, either you know, losing a loved one or, 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 or you know, grieving, um, uh, falling in love, um, trying to uh, get through uh, creative blocks, you know, all, all of these things that we go through, they're all in their own way, extraordinary, rich uh, places to create stories. Um, and under stressful circumstances, I think it affects the way that you see the world. And this was really made clear to me uh, when I, I made a film called Luna, which was um, a feature film about a couple and the, one of the couples had lost a child. And it was inspired by a friend, a very good friend of mine from art school who went through that very sad circumstance. And when he could finally talk about it to me, which was a couple of years after the fact, um, the way that he explained the way the world shifted and um, everything became hypersensitive. It was almost like you had removed a layer of skin. Um, and everything became massively loaded with symbolic meaning. Um, I thought it was really moving. And so that was the script that I wrote. Uh, and it's not about him particularly. It's a, it, it, was, it was finding a place to use all those ideas and, and things that he gave me. Um, and so most of the stories that I write tend to be along similar lines, really. Black Dog is about Paul Nash going into this appalling situation of having to uh, go into the trenches of the First World War and dealing with that, and the way that, that the pressure of that, the stress of that, changes the way he feels about everything, himself, the world, and his work. And um, so I'm constantly sort of making notes about things as they occur to me. Um, I got interested in a writer called Arthur Macken, who's a... Um, I suppose he's a sort of horror fantasy writer. He's Welsh, late 19th century. Um, but he's a kind of a, he's a much more interesting than just being a horror writer. Uh, and uh, I found out, I read, I bought a book of his um, uh, letters. And um, he also lost his wife uh, and uh, to cancer and immediately fell in with a spiritualist crowd, uh, the Golden Dawn, trying to contact this other realm. And it's the subject of a lot of his writing. But all the time you get a sense that he doesn't really believe it. You know, he, can't, he kind of desperately hopes that there is another, another realm um, and, and loves the idea of it. But I think he's just too rational to really commit to that completely. Uh, but when, he, when his wife dies, you, I really felt that he just wanted to see her again you know he just wanted for there for there to be that other realm for he to for him to be able to see his wife again and i just thought that was really beautiful and a very moving idea so that was one um and then um uh i'm really really uh, inspired at the moment by the strain of nature writing there is and, and um, natural history writing and walking. Writers who walk and and write about the natural world as they walk. I've done a lot of work with Ian Sinclair, he's one of them, 
but Robert McFarlane is a key writer at the moment around here. And I've been reading all of his recommended, uh, his reading list. And they're all uh, uh, extraordinary. Roger Deakin and then Goldin, lots of people. Um, J.A. Baker, and Peregrine, lots of great books. And I've, it's, it's a hugely inspiring strain of writing, but it's also quite a political act, what they do. Um, they go into Edgelands and Scrub and, you know, not very, uh, not your usual beautiful woodlands and uh, natural history environments and pay attention to the names that locals give to certain areas and certain grasses and certain lichens and by giving name and and by looking into the character of, of these often um, uh, you know dismissed areas of land um, it, what it says is that they're not just wasteland they're not just waiting for houses to be built on them they're not just out waiting to be redeveloped they are ecosystems they are living and breathing and they're as important to us as anything so I really love all of that uh, and then the final element was um, I think probably like a lot of people I felt pretty powerless and bewildered by a lot of events in the world over the last three, four years. Uh, I'm here in England and we've had our own problems. You're in America, you've had your own problems. Um, and you, you know, you just feel powerless. I go down the pub and I whine at my friends about what's going on, but it doesn't really feel like that accomplishes anything. And so the only thing I can do really is write and draw pictures. So I wanted to, I wanted to put something of my uh, frustration and, and uh, bewilderment and observations into the writing that I'm doing at the moment. And so a little bit of that went into Raptor as well. It's quite hidden uh, and it's a kind of a satire rather than anything else. Uh, but it's there and I'm happy that it's there and if anybody picks up on it then that's great. I, yeah, now that you say it, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> There's a kind of little little subplot in there that now I, I now understand 100% uh, what you're talking about. And that's so funny because when I was reading, granted, I was reading it a little quickly just as part of my preparation, but it didn't even occur to me that like, oh, yes, of course, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's ideal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, five, five years after the fact, you go, ah, oh, of course. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and that while well, speaking of after the fact, just to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, the thing the thing that I forgot to mention when I was telling my little personal narratives, uh, and this relates just to the diversity of your work, is that it took me a long time to realize that the same person who did the Sandman covers that were knocking me out was the same person who did the um, Batman comic that had creeped me out, you know, because, uh, you know, in the pre-internet era, you know, it's like, if you know, I, I wouldn't have even remembered, you know, who who uh, wrote and drew that book necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, th there are all these like moments where things kind of click sometimes and it's like, oh, this is the same person who did that, you know, and it's it's, it's always, um, and, and I think especially in the case of artists who are working across multiple media that can become, uh, very striking too and they're like you know and that's also just the fun of research too is finding connections that didn't exist um, but anyway to go back to um, Raptor uh, you know there's that element uh, one of the things I wanted uh, well what you were saying by the way about nature writing that's definitely a strong point that comes through in the power of nature that's a strong point that comes through really at the end of um, the, uh, of of Raptor in, in the narrative of that main character whose whose experience is is somewhat based on that of your friend who you were just describing, you know. And as I was getting to the end of that book too, it real I realized as well that it's like there was something about that that connected it to the Paul Nash book. In that both both of the books, in a way, in in different ways, um, could have you know kind of almost culminate with this. Um, renewed connection to nature or enhanced perception of nature. Um, is that something that's a big part of your life? Um, well, it is. Um, and, and I mean, that, that, that's uh, about, when would it be? About four or five years ago, five years ago, six years ago. Um, I, I 
really needed to um, do something about my health. And um, I had a couple of friends who used to go bird watching and they invited me along. And I always thought going for a walk was a total waste of time. Um, I liked playing badminton or something with a, with, with, a, with a score where you can win, you know. But I, who wins walking? It's re- what a ridiculous waste of time. Anyway, I went and um, I've been walking ever since. I absolutely love it. I, spend, I go every morning and walk for between an hour and two hours. And it's turned out to be the best use of an hour um, I, I could possibly imagine. I usually take a problem with me. Uh, something to solve, a storytelling idea to solve, or an image I have to create, or a bit of dialogue, or all sorts of problems I've taken with me over the years. Um, and just uh, I listen to music and or listen to the birds and, um, and think about the problem and then come back and make notes. And it clears my head. I've loved reconnecting with the um, seasons passing and the bird life around here. I'm taking photographs of the birds as well. Um, it's been wonderful and it's completely changed my life to a degree Um, and so a lot of that enthusiasm for that has gone into uh, both the books Um, there's a sequence at the end of Black Dog where Nash and a friend that he makes acquaintance that he makes go for a walk and um, a lot of their ruminations are are, uh, almost autobiographical really and then Raptor is another walking book Uh, I won't, I won't say how it ends, but the final uh, conversation of two of the characters is basically, I mean, that's my, uh, my um, manifesto at the moment, really. So yeah, they, they are very much based on my newfound love of uh, walking. Yeah, I've I've also, um, especially during the past year and a half, uh, disco- rediscovered the the pleasure of long nature walks that <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't really embraced before. And I grew up in a rather um, you know woodsy sort of area, but had never really connected with it. But then go, going back and visiting uh, my family's home during the pandemic, I've just been going on just as you said these like one plus hour walks and 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 um it's it's meditative and mentally and physically recuperative and and it takes me about half the walk to kind of churn through the stuff in my head to the point where i'm just noticing a bird or a leaf or an insect or a tadpole in the river or something you know it's something uh, but then when i get to that point and i find myself like hyper focused on those details i mean it's like i think it, it's like meditation or something and i i, I just feel personally a lot better and I've definitely benefited from that this past uh, year and a half. Um, we're coming close to the end of uh, our time here. There was one question in the Q&A that I thought I would go ahead and ask uh, okay. on behalf of the person who, who posted it. Uh, and this is a question from Eric Rose and Eric wrote, um, as one of the rare artists who does both commercial work and gallery exhibitions, do you think about how your comics pages will stand on their own as a work of art? Or is it all about serving the story and the pages are a product for creating the commercial work? And if they turn out to be a gallery piece, all the better. Um, so I guess it's that question of the, the standalone nature of the, of the piece you know, and, and its potential like art piece, but uh, qualities versus its, its function narratively within the text? Um, to, to be honest, they're, they're all slightly different, um, but usually um, I'm really just trying to make the book and serve the story. And so um, whatever it takes to do that is, is what I'll be doing. Um, so Raptor actually ended up being um, mostly just single drawings lots and lots of single drawings and I draw them again and again, draw the characters again and again and again. Um, And so it was just not practical to try and do that in the context of a whole comic page. So I just did individual drawings and then pieced it all together in in Photoshop afterwards. So there are very few complete pages for Raptor. Black Dog, for some reason, uh, maybe because it it was related to Nash um, and I had a sense uh, and related to the Tate and related to 1418 now, I had a sense that at some point 
they're going to be on a wall somewhere. So a lot of those pages ended up being pretty much complete as uh, finished pages. Um, very, very occasionally I've done stories knowing that they're going to be exhibited. So I make sure that they are complete single pages. Um, I did a short story called Black Holes um, that was at the Lazaridis Gallery in London. And so I knew it had to be on the wall. Most of the time, though, I'm really just serving the story and I'll, I'll do whatever's needed for that. OK, thanks so much. Um, and with that, we're at the end of our time. I just want to uh, once again thank you, Dave, for uh, sharing all of this great insight and experience with us. It's, it's been really interesting to hear you talk about such a wide uh, range of topics, so many different aspects of your career and some of the things you've been involved with. But I'm also glad um, we've really gotten to hear a lot from you about the the work that you've written and drawn yourself as a cartoonist. And I think it's exciting, you know, that you're put, you know, you've been uh, publishing these graphic novels recently. I did want to actually ask, just speaking of uh, recent graphic novels, I did want to ask one other very quick question, just out of curiosity. I noticed that Raptor is subtitled a so-called graphic novel, so-called uh, which is the name of the main character. Yeah. Um, is, is, is it your intention to continue making work with this character? Um, it, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't have anything in mind, but yes, um, I, I thought he was a, if I was ever going to create a character that I could return to and explore different things with, I like this idea of somebody trapped between states, trapped between fantasy and reality, trapped between fiction and, and, um, and the real world, trapped between the state of humanness and bird animalness, you know, while, while being, being uh, part of nature. Um, and uh, I, I thought that was a way, a place where I could explore lots of different things, the arguments to and fro on a lot of different things. So I have a, you know, a couple of possible things in mind uh, the, 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 the traveller there, the uh, falconer, Sokol, would be the, the continuing character. Um, the Arthur character, the writer, would just be for this book. Uh, in the next one, he might pop up in the 15th century uh, and speak to a writer who, or, or a person who was around then, or maybe 400 years in the future, or I don't know what. Um, but my, my idea was that he represented this, this disturbed state, this other realm that we touch when we are, when our lives are disturbed, when we're going through a difficult time, a difficult, disturbing time in our lives. We get a sense of this other place, uh, the source of creativity, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and he represents that. So there would be a meeting. Great. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dave. Again, I really appreciate it. Thanks to uh, Philippe Le Bon for organizing this talk. Once again, that exhibit is going to be up through mid August. Uh, so if you're in the New York City area, um, the, uh, the exhibition is still there uh, for you to see. And thanks very much to the Society of Illustrators uh, for hosting uh, tonight's talk. Um, thanks specifically to Anel Miller, the director of the Society of Illustrators, and to Lindsay uh, Compton, uh, who, coordinated, who coordinated everything today. Um, so with that, thank you again. Thanks to the audience. Um, and uh, I'll be ending the session now. Um, and uh, we can all look forward to uh, reading Dave's next book. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.